Welcome to the town board meeting, December 6th. Please rise and salute the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Emergency exits are to my right. Uh, near the uh, deputy town clerk and also the door you came in. Roll, please. Oh, that's you. Yes, that's you. I don't even know where that one is. That's ours. Just say our names, honey. Uh, Supervisor Perotti. Here. Deputy Supervisor Vicki Doyle. Here. Councilman James Morris. Here. Councilwoman Mich Michelle Samoji. Here. Councilman Damian Gutierrez. Here. <laughs> Here. Make a motion to open a public hearing for the noise law update. Second. We'll also, yes. Oh. I'll say aye. <laughs> I'll say aye. 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 Okay. <clears throat> Okay, um, public comment for the public hearing for noise, Leo. I have a few uh, questions about the, um, the, the ordinance. Um, although I'm very glad the town board made an effort to tighten the, uh, the noise code since um, when there've been problems in the past, it, it seemed that it was too vague to enforce. So I'm glad that there are some updates. Um, um, could you introduce yourself? Oh, yes. I'm Leo Blackman from Wasaic. Um, under unreasonable noise, section B, standards to be considered, um, there are 11 uh, different uh, uh, categories, um, intensity, duration, uh, proximity, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think it's really helpful to enumerate um, the contributors to the, the noise problem. But I'm, I just wonder if it's going to be easier for the uh, zoning enforcement officer to make a determination and, in, and enforce it, since that seemed to be a problem the last time around. I mean, there's no, um, there's no uh, decibel readings, um, which I know were part of it possibly earlier, but um, I think there was a concern about having to train someone to use the decibel meter. So again, it seems to me pretty subjective, so um, I'm hoping that uh, that you've actually spoken to the ZEO and gotten a sense from him that he feels confident that he can actually um, pursue noise violations because I know that's been a problem in the past. Um, I also uh, wanted to understand um, whether the complaint, determination, violation, and fine are all through the ZEO or whether the supervisor, the town board, the planning board, and the ZBA have any role in that. Um, if it's all through the ZEO, that's fine, but there isn't anything spelled out about how the other, um, the other parts of the government would, um, would be part of that. And um, I wondered how transparent the process would be to all parties, both to the person who files the complaint, the person who's complained about, um, to the town board or the, the planning board, uh, uh, all of the, and the, you know, basically everyone, because I think the last time through it was very, um, it was handled in a way that I think didn't give anyone any satisfaction and the parties weren't kind of informed about what was going on. Um, there were a few things about uh, specific acts that I wanted to ask questions about. Um, uh, uh, number one and two, we're talking about horns and noisy vehicles. And I just wondered how one measures that if it's temporal. Um, you know, I, I don't imagine the ZEO can like get out there, you know, in the time it takes for a, a car to pass. So again, I'm just wondering how, uh, what the expectation is in terms of how that would be, uh, how that would be quantified. Um, in uh, items 5, 13, 14, and 16, um, which were construction noises and, and various other um, uh, kind of regular noises, mm -hmm. it established at the time of day allowed, which is basically weekdays from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, that seems a long time for construction um, till 9 p.m. at night, and I wondered if uh, something like 8 to 6 p.m., 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. would be more reasonable. I, I've never seen that big a spread. Actually, I'm a little surprised by that. Um, 
And then the, the last thing is uh, impulsive sound levels. Um, again, I, there's no specification for day or time of day for that, um, or whether it's seasonal. Um, there's nothing in the, um, in the code specifically, specific to um, uh, shooting clubs, of which there are several in Amenia, but there's nothing about uh, noise volume or shooting, but none of those seem to be located in a way that they're kind of uh, very much of a problem. Um, but, uh, and obviously there's hunting season, which is swell, but um, again, I'm just kind of concerned again with impulsive sound that, um, that either there needs to be a limit in terms of when it's allowed, um, or uh, a season or something, because I, I know that a lot of people were complaining, that sounded like Trump, um, a lot of people uh, have complained to me um, about the noise and specifically that there's um, uh, noise ricocheting in our valley. Um, it clearly travels quite a distance, so if I can approach the bench with a visual aid. Um, Um, I made a map which overlays a, a aerial view of, of uh, Amenia with, um, with a topographic map. And um, it's beautiful. Um, this is where the, uh, the shooter is shooting, kind of pretty high up. I think it's actually 600 feet, not 700 feet, up, of, up on this mountain. This is, um, uh, this is 22 going through, and um, Oldry 22 uh, turns off uh, uh, here, um, that's where I am. So I'm sorry, because 22 is here, and that's older. 22 comes back this way. So I'm the closest to the shooter. Um, so uh, in the summer, um, I am in the yard a lot. We're sitting on the screen porch, and Do you um, uh, maybe use Victoria. Here? What? And if you use that, so people. Oh sure, I'm sorry. Okay, that, no, no, you're doing good. Um, <laughs> So, um, oh, you got one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the um, I'm the closest to the sound, and again, I didn't. Um, this wasn't printed out to scale, so I didn't actually measure um, the distances involved. Um, the Reagans up the hill were very bothered by the noise, but again, we're pretty close. Um, um, the noise can be heard in the hamlet of Wasak. Um, the Peaks can hear it about halfway to Amenia, and. Um, uh, uh, Terry Cook, who lives actually in the hamlet of Amini, can hear the noise and is bothered by it. Um, and this is actually the Metcalfs. So the distance from here to uh, here, um, from the center of Amini to um, uh, well past the, um, the, uh, the, the, I mean, basically about as far as the DDSO, I don't know how many miles that is, but that's, I mean, this is just people that I know. About three miles, yeah. but it's like an amazing number of people. I mean, assuming all the residents can hear it as well as I can, which I kind of assume they can. It's an amazing number of people um, who are disturbed by this, and that was the point I tried to make two years ago when this noise started. Um, and so I'm really hopeful that the new noise code, um, that the ZEO will be able to deal with it now. Um, uh, again, I, 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 there may be ways to sort of buffer the sound. Uh, it may be possible that this guy can only be allowed to do it um, on weekdays or only um, only uh, 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 Saturdays and Sundays um, in the spring and the fall, but um, or in the winter or during hunting season. But the idea that this goes on through the whole summer um, is really infuriating and unreasonable in terms of the basic premise of the noise code, which is that people are supposed to be able to use their property um, un, un, uh, uh, molested. And um, again, I. I outlined this same height as it goes around the valley. So this is to the west and this is to the east. And you can see that we've got a steep mountain all the way along here. Um, Silo Ridge is over here, so this is the mountain behind that. Um, and this is uh, opposite the Wasaic Hamlet. I don't know what that edge is called, but uh, you can see that because of where this guy is in the valley, he's at the absolute narrowest point, and the, side is just, the sound is just bouncing from side to side. Um, and um, it's a particular problem, so um, it's one that I hope the new noise code will deal with because, um, again, it's been going on for two years and the, um, the ZEO hasn't felt he's able to take action, so I hope he can now.
It's interesting because I live, I guess, over here. Mm -hmm. I don't really hear it so much. I think you're right that it's hemmed in by these two ridges. Right, because you have another high point here that's probably a buffer. It's buffering it. Yeah. yeah, it's very selective in the way it bounces. Yeah. I mean, the, those are made up. That was just to sort of connect the dots. But no, 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 but no, I know, mean, but it is I think clear you're right that, that that's the line of the hearing. It's not even though I'm closer than that. Right, right. It's not affecting it. Yeah, because you have this as a buffer. Yeah. So it really depends. I mean, there are some higher topography points here and stuff. Topography is all a about big the deal about how. But the topography is so specific to Amenia that um, distance is less important and topography more yeah. important. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, if you have, if you could leave that, that's fine. If you could sure. also copy it, that's fine. We just need to make sure it gets a little bit of My scanner isn't that big, but I can Okay. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah, this is Charles Gottlieb from uh, Dave Everett's office. Oh, who's, who's, oh, actually who's, writing, sorry. who's actually writing the, the noise law right. update for us. Okay, is there any other comment for the uh, noise law update? Would you like to speak? No? Anyone else? Uh, I did have a few. I did say I would go speak to the, uh, the two gun clubs in town. Um, they shared some concern uh, regarding the enforceability of this as it's currently written. Um, noting specifically the lack of a, a decibel reading for violations. Uh, they, or some of the other things I talked with about them. Um, there were, uh, there were a couple of concerns that, um, they were not specifically exempted, um, uh, by name in the law, so sort of grandfathered in, um, and uh, consider that potentially as a threat to their their uh, business. Um, and there was one note about language regarding the harming of animals. I'm trying to see if I can find this. <clears throat> uh, where is the? Eleven animals. Sorry. No, it's not the noise from animals. It was uh, harming animals. <clears throat> uh, it was with regard to uh, to shooting. Maybe it didn't make it into the slightest draft. Something about. Animals. I don't recall um, that being in, that, in any draft. In any draft? Related no. to the harm, maybe the noise from animals. Oh, here it is. Under unreasonable noise, it says, um, uh, means any excessive, unusually loud sound, blah, 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 uh, means a bunch of things listed, and then all this part of the injury to animal life and the property of business. That's uh, unreasonable noise, section A. There you go. Thank you. Um, and so one of their concerns with that, and let me just read that on mic then. So unreasonable noise defined as uh, here in A means any excessive or unusually loud sound or any sound which either annoys, disturbs, injures, or endangers the comfort, repose, health, peace, safety of a reasonable person of normal sensibilities or which causes injury to animal life or damage to property or business. So. The concern there was that that could be potentially interpreted as noise from gunshots by hunters potentially clearly intending to kill what they're hunting. Certainly. Um, and so that was flagged as a concern. So uh, I, I can address how, the comments however you guys would like, starting with Mr. Blackman's is it? comments and then going on to these if you wish, or I can do these first, whatever the board would prefer. Um, 
and unless you are you done with well what, why don't that's that's the summary of the feedback I got from the, the okay. Google club so um, some background on the noise ordinance noise ordinance noise ordinances are traditionally tough to write uh, for enforceability reasons. Uh, you really have to thread the needle on them. Luckily, the Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in the state of New York, in 2016 reviewed the city of Syracuse's noise ordinance and upheld that noise ordinance. We drafted this model, um, slightly tweaking your previous noise ordinance to reflect that court opinion. Um, a lot of that language comes from that court case and how we structured things. Um, going to the kind of injury of animals and properties and so forth, um, there is no problem in striking that language if the board wishes. The important language in that definition is of a reasonable person of normal sensibilities because that makes it an objective standard. Um, so we can certainly strike that. I don't think the intent of it was to ever include hunting. Um, I think more so it was loud noises that might uh, injure an animal's ears and so forth, whereas hunting, um, you could make the argument that it's not the noise that's injuring the animal, but in fact the device that you're hunting with oh, is what makes is, a lot more sense. Yeah, injuring the animal. Um, as far as property goes, um, injury to property means you're being disturbed by the unreasonable noise to the point where you can't, well, you can't enjoy your property. Um, it also falls under those factors under Section B, which give the code enforcement officer some flexibility in how he enforces it. So in accordance with that court case, we, could have, we have no problem striking that language um, and keeping the language in there that is necessary. Uh, that's certainly at the I board's have discretion. a tiny, uh, I, I, the way you've explained it now makes it um, read properly to me mm -hmm. anyway. Um, the problem I have is that if you have animals which are uh, prone to being afraid of noises, so if you have animal uh, horses and a big investment and this is horse and cattle territory, you know, I think it should stay in there because uh, somebody causing noise that really upsets them and causes them to run around and um, hurt themselves, it's, it's not ideal. Not that I've seen that happening, but I can see where it could. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that would be fine, but I mean, the point is to protect legal permitted hunting activities in this town. You um, could say, uh, obviously, this excludes. Um, right, so we could, if we left that as it were, as long as there was some explicit call that says, you know, we, we have a, bun a bunch of exemptions, right? Mm -hmm. So adding to that list of exemptions in section 80-5, um, adding any noise from permitted legal hunting activities during those, dur you know, during, during legal season. Yeah, um, that is certainly something that is more than reasonable to add in. Exceptions. It would not be a problem. Okay. I think that would address the uh, the concern, um, and then I don't know if it's typical to list in the code uh, under these under exemptions or whatever. List certain list basically the two gun clubs that we know are have been in operation for many years here in this town, um, and. Uh, uh, there's a couple different ways uh, we could approach that. Um, to answer one of Mr. Blackman's uh, concerns related to um, impulsive sounds, which is where the shooting would come in. It's the repetition of the sound. Um, the code as it's drafted now reads, no person shall cause, operate, or permit, or to be operated any impulsive sound levels for commercial, recreational, or personal purposes between sunset and 8 a.m. the following day. So as long as those gun clubs are not operating between sunset and 8 a.m. the following day, which I'm not sure if they are or they are not, um, they would be okay under this law. If they do operate past sunset, which probably more than likely they are if they're open till 7 p.m. in the winter, or even well, 4.30 p.m. in the winter in some instances, um, we can certainly add language in there that um, excludes that specific use of a gun club. Um, that wouldn't be a problem because they are permitted in a different manner 
there would be permitted under the planning board's site plan authority. Um, and if new gun clubs were to be erected, the planning board then could set conditions as to their hours of operations right. and so forth. And so that kind of leads to my, my larger question for this whole thing is, is there, is there a sense that this would be better defined by reference, referencing specific uh, zoning, like parcel types? So, you know, I wouldn't want, for example, Jax to have to deal with a complaint because he's using his, you know, impact drill to take a wheel off of a car and somebody determines that that's impulsive noise and so you know, that's a commercial a commercially zoned parcel sure. so part of the problem is that we're dealing with residential or rural residential parcels where people are trying to people are trying to enjoy their residential properties and these adjacent noises are are causing distress but from from a commercial standpoint um, it seems like maybe the same the same threshold shouldn't apply to everything. Sure, so we can look into that. The court cases that we reviewed um, and a lot of the jur other jurisdictions that we reviewed do not have it set up where it's on a property by property basis where you would have this regulation applying in this zoning district and this regulation applying in that zoning district. Um, I'm not sure it's feasible at this point and I'll tell you why. It's because this is not in the zoning code. Um, cases of appell that you can, under a zoning code, have different sets of regulations so long as it's the same regulation for each specific zoning district. Because this is outside of the zoning code, it has to be generally applicable to all properties. Um, but the way we can work around that is you, this law gives the code enforcement officer the authority to be, and any other law enforcement officer, to judge what is unreasonable and what's not unreasonable. And he has these lists of factors under the definition of unreasonable noise. So if you know, Citizen X is simply changing a tire um, or doing something that's in line with their permitted commercial use, um, that might fall under one of these characteristics where the code enforcement officer can say, well, he's only doing it in this one instance. It was temporary. It was not of a large nature. Um, it was consistent with the use of the property. Um, I'm not going to deem that unreasonable. Um, this code as written, or this law as written, doesn't allow a citizen to come in and say, you're doing an unreasonable noise, I'm gonna take you to court. Um, it really gives the code enforcement officer to determine what's, what's unreasonable and what's not unreasonable. Um, so we can look into whether or not we could apply this to different areas of the town, but off the top of my head, I think our research is going to find that we can't because it has to apply to everyone evenly. So do we specifically call out then in that definition of reasonable and unreasonable whether the noises are in line with the, uh, the intent of the permitted use of that property? So number two is whether the nature of the noise is usual or unusual. This list of criteria is from the uh, noise ordinance that was upheld by the Court of Appeals. And so in that instance, you could say, um, is the noise, um, let's say, of an auto repair shop usual? Um, the code enforcement officer could argue, yes, certainly it is usual because this is a auto shop and they're changing tires. Um, therefore, it's, you know, it, it's not unreasonable. Okay, I mean, that makes sense to me. I just, that, uh, compared to the list of exemptions, which is, you know, like church bells, for example. Mm -hmm. It's like we went out of our way to say church bells are fine, even though clearly if it's a church, that's a usual yes. noise you would hear from a church. So, And the reason specifically that is um, excluded is because of federal laws uh, protecting religious institutions from local ordinances. Um, and that's why we try to put in these list of factors to try to protect other usual uses that we might find in the town. Got it. So the other uh, issue. So I just go ahead. Go ahead. Point about animals. Um, uh, something that might not otherwise be considered is that. Um, uh, the shooting actually uh, makes my two dogs and the three or four other dogs in the neighborhood bark and howl uh, for the whole time the shooting was going on. So if the noise of the shooting wasn't disturbing the neighbors, the barking certainly does. So 
Um, I don't know that that's the right way to solve it, but you should be aware that that's another kind of byproduct of yeah. the excessive noise. And number 11 prohibits animals from making too much noise. Right, because they can't help themselves. <laughs> so we have had an issue of uh, repeated complaints from someone who lives very close to someone who is processing wood and trees on their property. Um, how does 14 address that issue? So section 14 as reference states that no person shall operate or permit to be operated any domestic to, domestic or industrial to, tools, machinery, and equipment for the processing or splitting of wood trees for commercial or residential purposes so as to create unreasonable noise across a residential property boundary except between the hours of 8 a.m. and sunset. So Every if, single day, they are then going to be subjected to the noise of a wood processing activity, potentially. So there's, a, uh, as always, it depends. Um, it sounds like they're a residential property and that they're, it's, a, it's a residence. Um, so if the wood splitting is an accessory use to that residence, so if he's splitting wood for purposes of heating, um, that is a permitted use. Mm -hmm. If he is splitting wood or um, harvesting wood of any kind of that property to the extent that he's uh, selling it for a commercial purpose, mm -hmm. he's now no longer, um, he's, he's taken that step forward into timber harvesting under okay. the zoning code. Mm -hmm. That can be enforced differently under the zoning code and it's a permitted use issue for the code enforcement officer. Right, but if somebody's doing this for just residential purposes and is just harvesting day in, day out, or, or they're um, processing this into firewood day mm -hmm. in, day out, the only relief they would get is, the only time that that would be a, considered an unreasonable noise is from, from after, so after sunset. Right, so during the night, after sunset to 8 a.m. the next day, if he was so doing can, the- they, they can sleep but they, the next morning it's gonna start up again. Yeah, and certainly, we, as the town board wishes, we can revise the timing of that um, to whatever you're comfortable with. Um, the idea of completely prohibiting someone I don't wouldn't from say prohibiting. That. I would just say that in cases where there's property boundaries, where that machinery is happening within 50 feet of somebody's window so that windows can't be opened or the, the, the logs and the equipment is right out on the road, right alongside the edge of the road. Is there any way whatsoever to make a mandatory setback so that it's not right in there? Because um, property lines can be very, very tight in mm -hmm. our more dense areas. Other places where they're not, you know, they have more room, perhaps there would be some way of enforcing some kind of setback is all I'm saying. Yeah, we could certainly add something that would be to, into the zoning code um, that is a distance the board is comfortable with from a residential property line where that type of ex accessory use can be conducted. I think that's appropriate given the proximity in many of our hamlets where you cannot get away from the noise. If it's happening on an adjoining parcel that's 0.17 acres and you're 0.17 acres and you're cheek to jowl with them and they decide to do this and all you can do is sleep at night, that's when you can then plan. That's no longer enjoying the, your property. Ten feet. Ten feet. Ten feet. I mean, there are places that are, that are tight, tight, tight. And they shouldn't just be able to choose. Maybe they do have a bigger place, but maybe they have to find a place uh, within their property that it's not right outside their window to conduct that. And uh, we can suggest some language. Um, I do caution that we have to be careful that there are all sizes of residential parcels in the, in the town, and we might have to look at that because one thing we don't want to do is have a setback so large um, that for some people it ends up prohibiting that type of residential accessory use. Okay. Um, but, but we need to address sight distance. I mean, they have to be able to Negotiate see around it to get out of their driveway. And, and then the, the changes to the zoning law um, that are also 
um, a part of this hearing that we can discuss do address site distance concerns. And that's when such timber harvesting or logging materials are located in the front yard. Um, a commercial or residential Commercial use? or residential use. We added okay. it both under the timber harvesting section of the law yep. and also under the front yard um, setback section okay. of the law. Okay. I thought I had seen that and then I didn't see it again. So that's in the, in the zoning. Yep. We added, um, and I can recite the language, both under timber harvesting um, and under setbacks for accessory structures and uses. Um, all timber and wood materials or equipment, including but not limited to logs, processed wood, scrap wood, stumps, wood splitters and chippers, skidders, harvesters, heavy machinery, trucks, or other related vehicles, machinery, and equipment, if located in the front yard, shall provide adequate sight distance to allow for vehicles to safely access the e and exit the property from and onto public roads. Adequate sight distance shall be demonstrated by an un unobstructed and clear view of the intersection and the approaching roadway in both directions of sufficient length to permit the driver to anticipate and avoid potential collisions. All right. That um, seems pretty clear, and that would apply to any town road, any county road, any road whatsoever. Yep, we added it to um, Zoning Code Article 7, which are the supplementary regulations, and it applies to all dimensional regulations. Excellent. Would the board like um, to investigate this, the setback issue of the activities of the wood processing? Um, right. And if so, what distance um, would you find appropriate knowing the size of the parcels that are at issue? You had a residential buffer section, I don't know if it's been taken out since then, that preceded the front yard setback that said there needed the, um, the harvesting should not occur within 500 feet of a lot line of a parcel being used for residential use. So I don't know if that's been removed, but you did have this in an earlier iteration. I just wanted to point that out. So that um, was in an earlier uh, iteration. It was applicable to timber harvesting, uh, which is a commercial activity. But not processing. Um, well, timber harvesting includes processing, but it's for a commercial purpose. Oh, uh, I see. Where the concern here is not for a commercial purpose. Correct. Um, and it's for accessory, accessory residential purposes. But accessory use does have a lot line, I mean, does have a setback in the zoning code even now. So if it's an accessory use, it has to be a certain distance away from the, set in from the side yard, doesn't it? Uh, you know, I would have to, I didn't bring the area bulk regulations with me, but we can check. Um, but it would appear as though if, if, um, there is a is there if there is a concern we can make a larger accessory use setback for this type of processing specifically prohibiting it from occurring right under somebody's window if sure. the lot line happens to be well, tight but the problem i mean in wasaic as you guys know there's some lots that are 40 feet wide you know right. with a house on there and if someone has the right to heat their home with wood which mm -hmm. they should um, how, you know how how far away from both sides of that lot line are you going to ask them to, you know, split their logs and use their chainsaw where it's going to make any difference to, to any of the neighbors, you know, 20 feet in either direction? I'm not really sure that this, you know, like you said before, without, without introducing something that may prohibit the use on certain small lots seems not... Just doesn't doesn't seem like that's uh, that's within our our domain. Correct. One thing that is always uh, an option for the board is to uh, alter the hours of operation. Um, you can do that as you see fit. I would think weekends would be um, you know you you gotta at some point give somebody a break. Um, it doesn't seem like. Um, You're talking Saturday and Sunday? I, I guess so. Past That's what weekend? you said for the other um, unreasonable noises, is that you were saying weekends excluded. You know, personally, that's when, that's when I 
do my wood processing exactly. I and mean, have a job. So exactly. But you have to give somebody a break seven days a week. You know, if they're just, I don't know, that would be, I don't know how else you would cut. On weekends only? Okay, weekends only. They, they could do that and then leave the rest of the week so that you have some repose. I don't know. Don't think I'd want Sundays with that going on underneath my window, but maybe others think that's fine. One of the other options um, would be to take it out of this section of the zoning code um, and leave it in the hands of the code enforcement officer to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, section 83 of this law generally prohibits unreasonable noises. Um, if we take it out and not limit that in this section of the code, it would allow the code enforcement officer to go to the property where a complaint is mm -hmm. um, and then say this is being unreasonable. Mm -hmm. um, with that, however, there is always the caution that this type of processing processing is a permitted accessory use. Yeah. Um, so he has to be very careful in going forward and how he enforces that. And without guidelines, um, it could be tricky for the code enforcement officer mm -hmm. and subject it to an appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. where you might start to create some precedent. Right. I think he's looking for more specifics, not less. More guidance from the town board, not less. He's had uh, the opportunity under our existing one to handle this and he hasn't been able to come to any resolution. So, so two I, options know, I would My sense suggest. would be if I had, you know, knowing my property and knowing how close I am to my property, I, 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 I just don't think it makes sense if you, if you have a 0.17 acre parcel Perhaps it's not going to be possible to process logs on your property. It may be necessary for you to find a friend or somebody who has an open but, field, but that's, and you rent a log splitter and you do it there. It's but not. It's not for us to decide, right? That's state home rule. What? 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 What makes it a permitted use for a residential? What makes it a permitted use is that it's an accessory use to a residence. Um, so as, as determined by what? By whom? So the code defines accessory use, and also New York State case law defines accessory use, and it's, um, you know, I used to have it committed to memory, but it's uh, those uses that are customary uh, of the principal use, but that are smaller in nature to the principal use. So things that are accessory to a residence are such things as cutting wood for heating, um, parking your vehicles in your driveway, uh, putting a shed in your backyard, um, things of that nature. Now, things that are not accessory used to a residence would be if you're cutting those wood, the wood in the back and then selling it. Um, that now kind of jumps into a different category where you're a commercial purpose and it's not just using it for your residence. Um, could I just say something that might help? Um, it's getting unduly abstract, and I think what you need to know is that there is an elderly woman who needs to sleep, and there's a splitter, a wood splitter, right next to her window. And it actually exists. And as far as your question, Damien, um, people who heat with wood have to be able to cut the wood right outside the door and get back into the house in the cold of the winter, because that's a survival issue. So that's why you need to be able to do it. Yeah, I would say 50 feet setback, you know, just to give uh, somebody a chance to not have it right under there, you know, so unreasonably close to the uh, property line. case of a chainsaw, I mean, they make so much of a racket as it is. In a small parcel, there isn't, really isn't any place where you're going to be immune from the sound of it. They just make a lot of noise. Uh, so it's a, it's a problem. Uh, they have a right to do it, mm -hmm. and people are going to have to live with it. 
But if you're processing a large shipment of logs that are would fill a portion of this room, eight feet high, uh, 30 feet long, and you're doing that every day except for at night. Yeah, but how, if you have a you small, if you have a small parcel, how are you going to do that? You're going you're to not gonna have that purchase much, what, firewood wood. from someone else oh, right, or right, have it done right. elsewhere. <laughs> You're going to do it somewhere else I, I if get, you have not enough land to do that. But I think what, what, what Jim and I are saying is that that's not that's not for us to determine. There's there's state law and precedent that allows that to be as a permitted use, and so we well, can. We have the right to make laws. So because we have in our law, we say it's the we have the right to uh, enjoy our our property. So the town of Amenia has promised that to somebody. Now, how do you handle that when somebody's window, window, you can't open your windows, you can't talk on the phone, you can't hear the television. She is trapped in her house because she can't actually get out. She can't drive out of her driveway because the logs are obscuring her sight visit, a vision. Um, you, you know, at some point there's somebody's right here to enjoy their property and uh, we have the obligation to make sure that that if, if it if it's not possible for her to peacefully enjoy her property then we shouldn't have that in in our law can I, can I make a suggestion I, I'm a little confused as to whether this is under the noise code or, or the timber harvesting is a separate Piece. It's so under the noise. This is under noise, so it would be a regulation of noise coming from this uh, harvesting of wood. Because under standards to be considered, you have um, duration of the noise um, and proximity of the noise to sleeping facilities. So it seems to me that the zoning enforcement officer, I mean, that should make it fairly clear for the zoning enforcement officer. Also, if someone has a pile of wood that they're splitting that's the size of their house, they're not just using it to heat their house. I mean, it doesn't take that much wood. Um, it, well, it, sometimes they do three years in advance. So they will go on and on and on and on and on and then have it stockpiled for three years. So that's the issue. Then it goes away, everybody forgets about it, and then it, it, it becomes another issue. Okay. Well, it seems the fact that there are these standards to be considered, that that might help the zoning enforcement officer because, I mean, for instance, the proximity of noise to sleeping facilities is listed there specifically. And um, uh, the zoning district and the time of day or night and the duration of the noise um, and whether it's continuous or intermittent. Mm -hmm. So all of those factors presumably could be weighed by the zoning enforcement officer. So, I mean, you do have some protections in there in terms of what's reasonable. Sure, yeah. but that I mean, then some, the, the, the person who's accused of violating that could just say, I'm using this wood for heating my house. Right, but if they're splitting for three years in advance, they're just basically, I mean, a jerk, I'm sorry. So, um, you know. That's not, it's not really, that's not really for us to. Well, right. I might be able to help them. It's a, that scenario is if we are to take number 14 out of the law. Mm -hmm. That then allows a code enforcement officer, the local police, the sheriff, or the state police to come and say you're doing unreasonable noise and citing the reasons under the definition of unreasonable noise while you are, or why you are. Um, that is an okay regulation because we're still permitting the accessory use and you can say you can do it. Um, it is a permitted accessory use, but it can't be, can't result in an unreasonable noise. That's the problem. He does not, he's not able to, he needs more guidance on what qualifies as unreasonable. I think the more specific you can get, because what you've now done is made it perfectly capable of that happening every single day, except when she's asleep, except when the sun goes down. So. You've just made it totally legal for that to happen, other than in our zoning code, you can't uh, obscure sight distance, so that's sure. going to force that operation away from her windows and away from her driveway. Um, I think a 50 yard, a 50 yard setback is a modest uh, re request that um, if they're not producing unreasonable noise, you won't have a problem at all. Nobody cares where you have it. but. If you are uh, 
having people complain over and over and over and over again, then you need to set back from 50 feet or find another place. You don't, you know, you can't uh, process logs. Uh, you know, you could do the splitter. I don't know. They get the giant trees and then bring it and, and process it. It's like a huge industrial operation. I, I don't know. And sir, we serve at the board's pleasure. So whatever, you right. know, th that's how this was drafted. Um, whatever the board would like to see in it as far as changes as this goes, um, we will make that happen um, while still ensuring that it will be upheld in, in any court challenge. Sure, but don't take us down a feudal road and then bill us hourly for it. Like, if, if we know that we're doing something like that, in introducing a setback that may result in the processing of wood becoming a prohibited activity on a residential, a small residential parcel, and we know that that's going to be easily overturned, uh, then you know I wouldn't recommend that we. Sure, absolutely. We would not. We would not <laughs> suggest that. Basically, you have competing rights. Absolutely. And what the code enforcement officer is going to have to do is to exercise some judgment, where. If one is unduly infringing upon the right of the other because of duration, or length of time, or whatever, then he's got to use his judgment and say it's unreasonable under these circumstances. And I, I don't think you have to go any farther than that. You have two competing rights, so you can't just shut one out and. Uh, well, it would have been to, helpful to, to have our building, our code enforcement officer here to explain why that hasn't occurred to date. Well, he serves at our pleasure, so he could come in and speak to us about that. I, th I agree. That would be a good... Uh, a good, a good uh, use of our hourly wage is to actually have him speak to the town of Amenia so that we, town board, so that we can um, understand how this is or isn't going to help us with the existing issues in Amenia. I have uh, I have two other questions if we are ready to move on from this particular topic. But Vicki, I don't know if there's more you want to say on that. No, I've, I've explained what the problem is. I don't see that this has, in fact, uh, solved the problem. Uh, it's actually made it potentially worse, but I think the setbacks will help in their zoning code. Um, I, I am unhappy that we aren't able to uh, make a, a few more teeth in it given the uh, existing scenario. But if, if, well, if I'm the only one uh, supporting uh, that, then, then we can give this a try and see if, I don't think that we should take it out of, we need more specifics, not fewer, for the zoning enforcement officer to understand what it is he's supposed to do. And I don't know how he's going to, there's no um, decibel. Uh, there so isn't the current is, one. We could do nothing, right? We have decibel levels uh, that determine a violation in the current noise law. I, I don't, I don't want to come off as unsympathetic, and I don't think, I don't want to speak for others on the board. I don't think there's anybody here that is not sympathetic to the particular plight of this one resident, but. I'm not really sure if this is the proper way to address it. Um, you know, if, if, if we've asked our code enforcement officer to look at this, if he's received complaints from that resident and he has been unable to make a determination based on uh, the current, I feel like this gives him actually more flexibility with the removal of the decibel levels to make some determination. Um, but beyond that, I'm not really sure that we can legislate this one particular problem out of existence. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Huh? I think we should move on. Okay. The other two, the other two items that uh, have been brought up to me uh, as potential candidates for inclusion for specific uh, prohibitions are Jake Brakes, as we all know. That has come up a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, other towns have done it. Could you say that again? I'm sorry. Done what? Jake Brakes. Um, they are 
They are, uh, it's a braking system on a large truck that doesn't actually involve the wheel brakes, it uses the engine. But, uh, it's noisy. I don't really know what the enforcement mechanism would be for that, but uh, if it were included here, at minimum, we could put signs up or ask the county or state to put signs up on the road. Um, that's one thing that's been brought up a number of times by uh, our favorite citizen. And the other is a Tannerite. And I'm not sure if that is... Uh, a, a what? Tannerite. Tannerite is uh, an explosive that is used... Um, oh, that's the... Yes. The, that is used in, in the target targets, practice, in shooting and targets. And it shoots things up in the air like... Um, uh, fireworks. I, I don't know if it does that, but I do know that it's loud. Yeah, it's loud. Um, it's and loud. so, I don't know if it's within our right to prohibit, but given that this is noise, it's I know it's prohibited in some some towns do pro, do prohibit. Some towns do prohibit. It prohibited. may not be the noise law may not be the proper place to do that, mm -hmm. but we may ultimately end up addressing uh, noise problems if we address uh, the legal use of Tannerite as a shooting target in this town. That actually is one of the things that goes going on up the hill for me, because mm -hmm. I thought it was a cannon originally. Mm -hmm. um, but I was told that that was actually in state law that that was prohibited. And I haven't seen that. I don't I was believe told that's... that, so I better check that. I, I don't believe that's the case. Um, and again, we're not trying to pass laws to address any one particular. But I did check, when I did check with the gun clubs, they brought it up. And I did want to make sure that the they weren't in regular use by any of the, the gun clubs no, or you know, was a part of what they relied on for their commercial activity. Um, it, it, it was not, neither, neither uh, said as much. And so I'm not sure if there's a way to for a town to prohibit a substance like that, or specifically that substance in that use, but um, that might be something we'd like to look into. Well, uh, I was I spoke with one gentleman who is with a gun club and does the shooting and does all that. That's why when you said that word and I heard it again, I knew what he was saying. He explained to me that it's not illegal to purchase that item in New York State, but different towns in uh, in, in the state of New York have prohibited its use, especially if uh, in a town setting, you know, as we are like a media little town, uh, they have uh, said uh, not to use that because it's uh, uh, the way it explodes up in the air and stuff, that it can cause, besides noise, it could cause other problems. Personal injury? Personal injury and, and uh, fire and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's, that's what that gentleman explained to me, what that item was. And and uh, and it's a, it's like a candy. Well, he showed me it's like this big, Michelle. Sure. A can, and they shoot at it. And There's a couple ways um, that we can go about this. One is um, it's if it's a substance used for target practice, like you're saying, um, we could add it into the specific list. Um, we could have a. Um, kind of like we have one through uh, 15 or 17 here, we could have one for explosives. Um, you know, making explosives one of these per se violations of the noise ordinance. Uh, we could add it to the impulsive sound levels because it sounds like that would right. be an impulsive sound level. Right. And it's also related to a shooting activity. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we could address its noise. Now its actual use, um, that would likely be under a different local law addressing mm -hmm. explosives within the town. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of municipalities have these as, for blasting purposes mm -hmm. for construction, mm -hmm. um, but we could certainly use some examples of surrounding municipalities that have banned this exact explosive. Um, if the board would like us to do that investigation, we'd be more than happy. Um, as far as the brakes go, I think we could easily add the brakes once again the noise of the brakes, adding them to this uh, number two noisy vehicles, uh, where we talk about mufflers that aren't maintained and so forth, um, that these brakes and the unreasonable noise that results from them within the town, um, if they are heard, uh, they would be subject to a noise violation. Um, again, as far as prohibiting the actual brakes, that might be a little more complicated. It would be done by a different local law. Um, and we might run into trouble with the New York State vehicle and traffic law. Mm -hmm. um, but if other municipalities have done it, like you said... Well, I, I wasn't saying we should prohibit the brakes. Jake brakes being installed on trucks. We should just prohibit the use of, of, 
of Jake Briggs uh, while those vehicles are in town. So then it might be by adding it in this uh, noisy vehicle section, um, that seems like it would be a good That would fit. be enough, I think. Yeah. Great. And uh, Leo, Tannerite is not illegal in New York State. It was, uh, there has been a bill introduced by State Senator Alcantara, Alcantara and uh, Buchwald uh, because Tannerite was uh, found in the September 17th Chelsea terrorist attack in Manhattan. But it's, it's not, uh, it's, has not, it's currently still legal, according to what I just read on the internet. I see in the Hyde Park, um, law that they actually have penalties for offenses. So um, it says, if any party shall knowingly violate the provisions of this chapter or engage in conduct in violation of this chapter, he shall be punished by a fine of not less than $100 and not more than $250. Um, how do they, they issue a citation and um, so, follow up? Sure, yep, the way it works as it's drafted here, um, this was a product of the prior law that we didn't change much. Mm -hmm. um, the process now allows the code enforcement, it can be enforced by the code enforcement officer, um, the local police, okay. the sheriff's department, or the state police. It's any officer that has jurisdiction within the town of Amenia can enforce this law. What they would do is first issue a warning. Um, if it is not rectified after the warning, um, then it says, Noise control. A information and summons is then um, issued, mm -hmm. and that information and summons would be the violation. The court sends out the violation, um, and then you would proceed uh, to court to um, adjudicate uh, the issue. This does not. Uh, Mr. Blackman had had, had one question about. Um, going to the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning Board. Does any other board have jurisdiction over this? And the answer is no. Um, this noise law is not in the Zoning Code. Therefore, the Zoning Board of Appeals does not have jurisdiction over it. It's just simply within the town code. Um, so a violation would be issued, information and summons would ensue, um, and then the matter would be heard by the town attorney in the local court. And the fines... Um, Fine, you just say not to exceed $250. Yes, not to exceed two hundred fifty dollars. So, I think the hundred dollars to not to exceed two hundred and fifty would make it more clear that this isn't a minor infraction. This is one hundred to not to exceed two fifty. Uh, if everybody else agrees, it seems to me that they should take it seriously when the code enforcement officers give them a warning. And they give them the warning, give them that code, then they have the right to come to the court and challenge it. So you, you want a minimum of, of $100? I would say, yeah, so that it's clear what the range is. I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, any other comments? No. Um, I just, you know, some more clarification. So when we go back and draft, um, related to the uh, wood processing and residential properties, do we want to leave it as drafted? Your options would be to leave it as drafted, to add some accessory setbacks um, that we would feel comfortable with um, and would be legal, um, or alter the times um, of when it would be permitted. So I don't know, maybe the board would like to take a, a, a poll or... Um, when, when having times in there, is there a way to allow it to be seven days a week, just not allow it to be for five or more consecutive days or something like that? Yeah, I, I don't see why not. I have not seen that um, in my either, experience, but, <laughs> but um, that seems reasonable. Um, I would say three consecutive days, just given the fact that you would be potentially starting at a.m. and going till sunset for five days in a row? Does that mean, seem? I mean, look, again, I process my own wood at my house, but I use my chainsaw four or five times a year. I don't, I don't use it. I have better things to do on every Saturday than to 
go split wood every Saturday. Uh, but three day weekends, good time to do chores. I don't know what the right consecutive. I'm, yeah. I'm okay either way. Whatever you want to do. Um, I think the reality is three, five, seven days, you'll still be, if it's under your window, you know, it is what it is. Well, can we exclude Sunday? Certainly. That seems reasonable, at minimum. I, I, I would prefer, I mean, if we're, if what we're really trying to do is like, give somebody a break from persistent noise. I would prefer some limit on consecutive days of, of this permitted, of this noise level, as opposed to excluding Sunday. Seems like there should be one day where they could say, you know what, I could have friends over. I could have somebody over. I could open up my windows. I could sit on my porch. One day. Um, that doesn't seem unreasonable. She has her daughter come visit, and she can't sit on the porch. She can't go outside. All the windows are closed, whether it's summer or, or not. You can't talk over the noise. So it seems to me you ought to promise one day, if it's Monday at midnight, you know, I mean, sometime when she can have visitors over and, and know that it's not going to be um, a prisoner in her house. I, I get it. And again, I'm just trying to think of a law that's not intended to satisfy the needs of one person specifically Sunday may be the best day for somebody to do their wood process okay. and I'm not sure how to get around that um, uh, if I might throw out an, uh, an opinion it seems to me that um, in meeting this balance um, what we have is not something that doesn't address it in the law, but an enforcement issue. Um, it might be prudent to have some training with the code enforcement officer, um, if that's what, what might be necessary to allow him to understand the flexibility and how this law is implemented, um, and give him then the ability to go out and figure out what is unreasonable, what's not unreasonable. Um, that was also one option. Um, but one thing he actually has done is sat down with both parties and worked out a compromise when, right, right. Mm -hmm. when they, you know, when they would do their, and then, <clears throat> and then days, days and times when they wouldn't. Is that in writing? <clears throat> is it in writing? No, it isn't in writing, but they worked it. That's the way they worked it, and that's the way they did it for, you know, for the rest of um, the last year, there was a problem. So there is no problem? Well, there is, a, there is a problem, but, you know, that they worked that out for a time. So I don't know if that's, you know, that isn't exactly enforcement. I mean, according to what our laws are. Yeah. I was just thinking the same thing about having a mediation. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Could, a reasonable because these result. are these are uh, with with the parties that that have the the, the the difficulty, and have them sit down and have them each explain in front of a neutral person, you know, like you, because you're just neutral, and uh, then figure out what's uh, the best way to solve I mean, it to make it comfortable for for both parties because they both have reasonable reasons, both of them. The problem with mediation is that you can't enforce it. Oh, yeah. um, and the other problem is that you have to have two reasonable people. Oh, and right. if one of them is unreasonable, you're never going to come to a conclusion that's going to be satisfactory. Oh, but as far problem. as enforcement, I'm sorry? I don't know what we, if what we have here, I don't know how you would enforce it other than to enforce the... It have to have, has to happen after, he, uh, after sunset. That's right. all you've got to the only thing the only thing you'd be able to enforce is the time right. and uh, we're in, in I think we should vote on it and make a decision about what's we think is unreasonable or not unreasonable because the code enforcement is relying on us I believe to give him the tools to know what it is we want 
Well, what we're doing here or attempting to do here is to give him more flexibility to use his discretion to make That's a call. Right. And what you're saying is that he wants more... He wants a, a script to follow, and that's incredibly difficult to, to do. Mm -hmm. So it is. He's got to exercise some judgment. That's mm -hmm. right. I mean, that's why we hired him to to be the code enforcement officer. And so, if he's unwilling to do that, then that's that's a different discussion. Well, it doesn't mean he's unwilling to do it. I. That's what was suggested previously by somebody else. And that's Not unwilling, just looking for more guidance. I believe more structure and enforceability. Okay, I think we beat this one to death tonight. Let's move on to something else. Um, what I would um, like to do, since there's more discussion needed in this, is to keep the public hearing open mm -hmm. and um, maybe do a, another draft based on some of the discussions we've had today. Sure. Because I don't, I don't think we're near a finished product at this point. Uh, what we could do is, when is the date of the next town board meeting that you would like? This December thirteenth. Yeah. December thirteenth. So we would adjourn the public hearing to a date certain, which would be December thirteenth. Um, the public would be able to come in and comment just as they always would. Um, and prior to then, we. Um, well, that is what next Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, so you actually might want to adjourn it to the town board meeting after that, to allow the the public to review any revised drafts. So we can um, we can adjourn it till January third. January third. If th that would be my recommendation to have that, the public review that meeting any is drafts. Really long, isn't it? That's our first meeting of the year. It's the real work meeting. Should we do it the second meeting of January, Victoria? I don't know. I mean, either way is fine with me, but that's a that's a really long meeting and people might be out of town. <clears throat> Is there any reason we can't do it next week? No, you certainly could. I mean, you can you can always if need be we can always set another public hearing in yeah. January. It doesn't mean we can't set another one. And we could, um, sorry, we could get the drafts uh, as soon as possible. Have them on file with the town clerk's office if the mm -hmm. public wanted to come and, and view them. Um, and we would and have, have them on the available website. at the meeting on the website. Uh, so yeah, the thirteenth sounds like uh, it'd be best to keep the ball moving. Mm -hmm. um, one thing um, I would say, just because I've been hearing a lot of different options, is maybe our office should draft up some of these options. And so if the board agrees on one of those options at the public hearing, um, they can close the public hearing at that time if they wish. Mm -hmm. um, or we cannot do these options um, and just kind of come back with a version based on your comments tonight. What would you like to do? Well, sorry. What's the? What are the sticking points? Really, we're the. We're talking about different options around the the wood. Around the wood, yeah. Areas. The other ones are quite clear. It's um, <clears throat> excluding uh, certain gun club uses, uh, excluding specifically hunting. Um, I heard excluding Sundays from the wood processing seemed to be a consensus. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, two of us. Uh, five. Um, so maybe that was not a consensus. Not a clear. But it's still, it's still a draft, and it's still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why, you know, you can't add things, of you course. know, that we've recommended. And you know, when we come to the public hearing, we can either keep it or scratch it or right. whatever. Can I, we invite I think our code he's enforcement saying. office so, yes. so he can help us understand? Yes. What I, the problems are. I think with, with Clay, is it? I'm sorry. Charlie. Char <clears throat> sorry? Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> what Charlie's saying is do we want Dave Everett's firm to draft up multiple versions of this I don't that think show it's different options? Because you have these slight variations sure. in your head. I think we understand mm -hmm. where our options lie. Uh, and I think we're close. We're yeah. just not. We'll try to strike that balance yeah, um, that we've been to. discussing. So the primary point of ambiguity that you need resolved right now before you can do another draft is on this wood issue. Yeah, you know, we could take another stab at it. 
Um, if the board has a preference um, as far as altering times, adding setbacks, um, or something, a completely new idea that we could brainstorm, um, let us know what your preference is. Otherwise, we could just, um, I can kind of digest what I heard tonight, go back to the drawing board and try to rework it so that it meets all the needs. So just a straw poll, 25 foot setback, anybody for that? If they're not for that, then you don't have to worry about it. Anybody want to speak up? Not for oh, it, I don't not know. for I, it. I, I don't see how that would be possible. I don't see how it works. 25 I don't see setback? that it There's really give you any benefit. There's what? You don't, don't see any I, benefit? No, Okay. I don't see anything. But, yeah, okay, so you don't have to worry about that. There's the two, three mm -hmm. people, it mm -hmm. looks like, that don't want that. Um, Michelle, correct? You're not yeah, no, for a setback. I, I, I'm not for the setback. Okay. I, I think. I think. So it's done. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I I don't like making the law for. No. Okay. It has to be for the whole town for everybody. It can't. Be. And it would be for everybody. Yeah. It just depends yeah. on how far you want that activity happening mm -hmm. from your house. Okay. And the consecutive days and excluding the Sundays, where would the board fall on that? So you guys need to speak up so that he can get to his work. You for Sundays or not Sundays? Excluding a particular day, at five consecutive days maximum or not? Or three or what's the preference? It doesn't matter, just yes. say. Oh. 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 I think Sunday should be a day of rest myself. I, should, I would think seriously that we should. Uh, uh, and you know what we can also do is um, I can quickly canvas surrounding municipalities um, and specifically targeted towards this aspect. And if there's something that I feel as though strikes a balance with everyone, I will add it and we'll go from there. Now, that's probably the best way for you to canvas and see what's going out there. Because we're each going to have a different opinion of three days, five days, Sundays, this, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't do wood cutting uh, in my place, my world. In my world, and I don't know anything about wood cutting. Uh, but I know people do it. I know my son has it on for his property where he is, but he's not even in this town. And he's got a big enough piece of property that if he wants to uh, do whatever it is, he can do whatever he wants. But so I'm not really a very good judge of wood cutting. So if you gave me ideas about what happens with other places sure. and other things, it'd be helpful to me because it's just way out of my Ballpark, is that what they say? Ballpark? I would be all for limiting it uh, and not having it allowed on Sundays. But the problem is you're going to find people out there that are going to say, Sunday is the only day I can do it. That's I true. work six days a week. So the, the law does, the problem. this draft of the law does allow somebody to, to request a, there's a, there's a, a variance. variance process, right? Uh, in a prior draft, there was a variance process. Um, we can certainly resurrect that <laughs> if the board wishes. Um, the variance process did allow someone to come in for a variance um, to the town board, mm. and then the town board could then grant a variance with conditions. Um, in this particular instance, you might have someone come in, ask for a variance, the town board would then grant it with conditions. Those would be enforceable by the code enforcement officer. Um, it's kind of like the result we were talking about with the mediation and an agreement. Yeah. How is that uh, enforceable? This would be a mediation and an agreement between the property owner and the town board um, through the variance process. That sounds like a very good escape clause for yeah, just like such that an instance. Work. Okay, so we that's easy enough. We have that in a prior draft. I can just add it back in. Okay, so if that's the case, then I'm fine with the Sunday exclusion. So am I continuing the public hearing or? Adjourned till? Yep, it's uh, adjourned till December 13th. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that time, if you're comfortable with the final language or you have language that we will finalize afterwards, you're more than welcome to close the public hearing at that time. Okay, then I make a motion to adjourn the public hearing to December 13th. Second. Motion to me, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, is there any public comment? I have one public comment, I guess. Um, since Leo is here, I was just wondering uh, if 
we could go over the protocol for the maintenance of the landscaping around the town hall. The landscaping was donated by Leo and his spouse, and that has been paid for, the maintenance has been paid for by that same entity. Um, when a per, or is anybody here in this town hall allowed to go to the company that they've hired to maintain it and say, um, give specific directions to how they like to have it maintained? My question is, no. Is there a protocol for somebody who in the town wants something done? It should go to you, Victoria, right? And and if you have a question about how it's maintained, you should go back to the people who are paying for that service. Correct. Okay. I just want to make it crystal clear. Everybody on this town board agrees there is a process for going and, and uh, making requests to the company who maintains the, the plantings. Wait. Leo pays for the landscaping of he Town does. Hall? He, Thank you. That's very nice. But he would prefer, I believe, that if somebody has a issue with the way they're being maintained, to go to Victoria and Victoria can alert Leo to the request and not unilaterally go straight to the eight maintenance company and say, I'd like X, well, Y, and Z done. That's what happened a couple of weeks ago that, <clears throat> that someone that joined oh. me to go back there. Uh, what happened a couple of weeks what happened a couple of weeks ago was that someone uh, directed the guys that we had um, coming to prune and told them to take the tops off all the trees because it was blocking some kind of view and there was some concern about terrorists. Um, I think Amini is kind of an unlikely target, but that's just my personal opinion. But anyway, the point is that she directed him um, to, to start cutting, and he called us and said, what should I do? Um, but it does seem like it would be better if it sort of came from, uh, from the board or from Victoria, so then we know how to respond to it. Um, okay. That would we be can, great. We can do that. Okay. And great. thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, supervisor's report. <clears throat> Wasaic Trail to the Train update. Wasaic Trail to the Train has received. Right of way clearance has been issued authorization to proceed to construction activities. Bid documents have been sent to Dutchess County to put on Empire BidNet site and are available to town clerk's office for bidders only. Bidding ends on 12-13-2018 at 12 p.m. Town of Amenia Highway Garage Land Update. OGS, the Office of General Services, is about to issue the deed for the five-acre parcel. Amenia Town Hall upgrades. Replacement energy efficient windows have been installed in the courtroom, court clerk's office, town hall meeting room, town clerk's office. Next and last to be installed are the assessor's office and building department. Water laws. Water laws have been approved and new water rates will be enclosed with the 2000 with the January 2019 water billing and will be in effect for the April 2019 water billing for months January, February, and March of 2019. Noise law update, public hearing date is on December 6, 2018. Information will be available in the town clerk's office. And on the town of Amina website, no other action will be taken at this meeting on the noise law update. Regional ambulance feasibility grant. The towns of Amenia, Dover, and Northeast with Dutchess County were awarded $190,000 to study with the assistance of a consultant establishing a regional ambulance district in order to reduce ambulance expenses for each town. A public hearing was held at the Amenia Town Hall on October 24, 2018. The towns are meeting to decide what should be included in RFP for bids on a 2020 ambulance on 2020 ambulance services as each town has a current contract with Northern Dutchess Paramedics through December 2019. Amenia Town Hall Generator. Bids are, current, bids are currently being requested for contractors to install a generator in the Amenia Town Hall. Information is available at the town clerk's office and can be requested in digital form. There will be a pre-bid walkthrough on December 10th at 10 a.m. Bids will be received at the town clerk's office on December 17th at 1, until December 17th at 1 p.m. Town clerk report. The monthly has been remitted an amount of $213.75. The 
the minutes have been circulated prior to the meeting. Are you ready to move on? Mm -hmm. so. so we had the one that we, the October 18th meeting where Jim and I were both, uh, both absent. We were unable to uh, to move on that last time, but we can this time if somebody has a motion. Would you want to make the motion? Sure, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as presented for uh, November fifteenth, twenty eighteen. A second. The motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. You have to. They have to uh, do it individually do it for, it the for the minutes. Well, I'm sorry for the also, October fifteenth minutes. Hold on, I'm sorry. Which There's, one are we doing? I, I withdraw my motion. <laughs> Hold on a second. <laughs> you weren't there. You weren't I there. Wa no, I can make the motion even though I wasn't there, but I oh, was yeah. there. You were there on the 15th? Yeah. I Look, I voted Vick, on Vicky everything. And I I were not there. That's right. It's Vicki and Jim. So, okay, I, so we're not voting on that one. So, was that for, because I have you not there? Oh, I'm sorry. Not that, 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 the only error is in the who is absent. Yeah. So I was there. Vicky was absent that day. Correct. This was the okay. snowstorm day. We shall have to do it over. Yeah. We can't vote on it as is. Okay, next. <laughs> um, I didn't notice that. Volunteer. Um, is the board ready to appoint the new volunteer for the recreation position? I would make a motion to thank for, and accept. Yeah, for Chris Milano. Chris Milano's uh, application to join the Recreation Board for the term ending in 2023. Second. I second. The motion's been made and seconded. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 The Zoning Board of Appeals reappoints um, with term to expire on 12 31 2022 for John Terry Metcalf. I make a motion that we ex reappoint him to that position. Anybody second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, water bids. Um, water district property on 343. There's one bid. Excuse me. Sorry. What? Oh, I see. Ten percent of the bid price shall accompany the bid. Okay, so we have a check for two hundred and fifty dollars per notice of sale for a bid of two thousand five hundred dollars for the sub property. For the what property? The sub water property. district okay. property. Okay. Okay. Um, other bids the office is collecting is the Wasik Trail to Train and Generator. And um, okay, so we. Do we need to accept that? We can get that. We we'll probably paid more for the survey. We did pay more for the survey. <laughs> what did the assess? What, what did the estimate of what that property was worth come back as? Does anybody recall? No. Um, it, it was it was around five thousand. It, it was shy of five thousand, as I recall. Forty five hundred, something like that. Something the like survey. That. That's what we paid. No, that was that was what the, the appraisal said. I don't know what the appraisal cost us, but it probably cost us a lot. But the so appraisal came up with a, with a fair market value less than five thousand dollars for that piece of property. This is a neighboring. Yeah. So I don't know if we have to accept it tonight. Uh, I wasn't brought up to speed on the procurement issue, but or at the prior meeting. Um, so what is the concern on the bid or the property? 
Well, we we have been trying to sell a piece of property in the water district. Okay. And we've um, bid it out several times, and this is the first time we've had a someone that has offered to purchase that. Okay. But it's and this, below what we think is uh, we were praised it for. And, and well, we have to praise. decide whether or not we're going to accept it. So I don't think we have to do it tonight. No, and um, you know I would defer to the uh, town attorney, town attorney um, as we've only been retained to be special sure. counsel for the Northern yeah, Zoning. Yeah, I will. Um, I want to table that until the next meeting. Sounds That's good. Fine. Fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the other bids the office was collecting was trail to train and the generator. Um, and just have the announcement that the reorg meeting is January 3rd. And for planning, the RFPs were received. We have five of them um, for planning consult. It says, please schedule a time with Dawn to receive the packages and complete the grading. And I do have them here. Yeah, we um, need to, the information for how we need to handle these, um, we have to grade each application. criteria you need to use to grade each application. This one is from Sterling Environmental Engineering. These um, were for a, for a planner. We actually um, did an RFP through the county, helped us with that. Uh, grading is supposed to be done on our own, right? We're not supposed to. Yes, you're not supposed to discuss it with it. each other. Just there seems to be enough copies here for everyone. Give the original to the town clerk. Um, aren't they supposed to stay at the town clerk's office? Well, we could. Why don't you give me that, and then I can I, give you all of them. I, 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 and then you could go in there and um, look at them and grade them. Okay. I just wanted to open them at the meeting so that you could see who they were from. Then we have to decide a, find it, uh, decide on a day to discuss our review of them. This is from Dunn and Sigurono Engineers, PLLC. It's like Christmas. <laughs> well, we, were, we did get five applications, so. Okay, this one is from Bar Down Studio. from AKRF. So there's um, information in the RFP about how to grade each one based mm -hmm. on the criteria set in the RFP. Mm -hmm. 
And the last one is from Nelson, Pope, and Voorhees. Planning and Secret Services for Town of Maine. So I'll let you take those best. Uh, our grades are due by when? Well, that's what we need to set a date based on how that, how that works with you. How much time you think you need to, because <clears throat> I sent you the email where it has it online. Mm -hmm. Well, basically what you can do when you do your grading, you can just do it on a piece of paper and then put it into the uh, online based on the criteria in the RFP. And just look at each contract and see if they met the criteria in the RFP and, you know, and your grading. And what we will do is send the grading out to Dutchess County and there's a formula they follow that will put um, percentages in it. Okay. So that we would go on from there. All right. Do <clears throat> you have anything else, Robin? Um, just that easy passes are being sold in the clerk's office and they make a great holiday gift. <laughs> do. <laughs> That's all. Okay, highway. Okay, we, uh, we made it through our first snowstorm, all right. Uh, we had two breakdowns. We had uh, one hose blue, uh, another truck, the, the sander chain broke. Uh, and the next time we went out, uh, everything ran fine. Um, last, this past Friday, we put in about 475, or 470 feet of uh, pipe on Yellow City to help uh, pick up some springs uh, in the side of the road causing a lot of ice issues, um, so hopefully that should help. Um, we worked with Lee's Trees cleaning up Tower Hill from damaged um, from March um, from the winter storm. Um, we received, we picked up our new uh, pickup on Monday and traded in the 2011, so we have a reliable truck again. Uh, today we filled some potholes, and I plan on putting in our um, our new six-wheeler into the Mina Prada lights tomorrow. Um, so we've been doing a little decorating today, too. And we've talked about um, putting in our two other dump trucks in the Auctions International, which I did. Um, they were in from November 21st and ended December 5th. Um, so at this point, we either accept, uh, decline, make a counter offer. Um, I suggest we um, accept the bids. Uh, both trucks are not really roadworthy. Uh, the 89 truck hasn't been used uh, probably three years, and they won't pass inspection. Uh, the 2000 uh, International went for 3400 the 89 went for 3,050, and for a total of 6,950. So at this point, we have to accept, decline, counter offer. I, I can make that motion if you want. Make a motion to accept the two bids we received uh, for both vehicles: the uh, 89 dump truck, the 2000 International. For a total of sixty nine fifty, six thousand nine hundred fifty dollars. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Two. The building report. We have um, Six new building permits totaling $8,906.50. 12 searches total $1,250. Two fire inspections of $100 and four renewals of $625, bringing the total for the month to $10,881.50. I think, and we have 
contracts? Or are there any other committee reports? Thank you. I don't think we're having a CAC uh, meeting on the third Wednesday. It'll be too close to Christmas. So I believe it is canceled, 1st of December. Okay, we have um, a lot of contracts that we have to renew. Um, Shrek, we usually do um, the level one service due to the age of the generators at the firehouse. And the prices are the same as last year. Make and we motion. also do the generator for the water department. Mm -hmm. that I make a motion that we authorize um, servicing of the generators. Second. Mm -hmm. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Stanger, Roberts, Davis, and Diamond. The rates are unchanged from the 2018 rates. I make a motion we accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we have Hillary Thomas, our special prosecutor. Um, her uh, legal billing rate has remained unchanged at $145 an hour. But um, she has, due to the complexity of the legal matters involved, I request that my legal billing rate be increased to $175 an hour. In my regular course of practice, my standard legal billing, billing rate is $250 an hour. I have enclosed a retainer agreement for your signature and approval. Just going from, sorry, 130, 145 to 175? Mm -hmm. That has been. legal billing rate. Yes. She's had some really complex cases with one person in particular. <laughs> so she prosecutes cases in the town court? On yes. behalf of the town? Mm hmm Yeah, we uh, originally got her because um, when there were um, cases, a lot of times um, the state trooper never showed up as a witness, so we hired the legal prosecutor. So she would be able to take care of those cases, but she's also been taking care of um, zoning issues. Mm -hmm. $175 is reasonable. Okay. Mm -hmm. She's very good. And she does a good job for us. She's I'll make a motion a time. that we authorize um, uh, Hillary Thomas for the rates as um, described for 2019. Okay, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> uh, Jacobowitz and Gubitz, um, they have this uh, same hourly rate in 2019 as 18, which are um, $225 an hour. Basically, they were hired for Kent Hollow. I make a motion we accept it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Uh, Roydy, Soika, and Andrews are uh, engineers for many years. Their rates have um, also stayed the same and their scope of work has stayed the same. Make a motion that we um, authorize Roydy and Soika for 2019 at the same rates. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Uh, George Janes, uh, who does um, visual simulation and um, is basically charging the same rates as he has fees and expenses at 175, 120 for senior associate and associates $100. We, um, we only use them on whenever a specific application requires it. Mm -hmm. A motion that we accept the uh, George James's rates as described. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah uh, rates have stayed the same. Be our attorney for the planning board. I'll make a motion that we 
uh, authorize the uh, uh, hiring of Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah at the rates, um, at the same rates as 2018 for 2019. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we have a uh, contract with the SPCA, which we've had for um, for many years, and we would just be renewing that. We only use it, um, you know, when on a, on occasion, but we need to have some place to <clears throat> bring the dogs. Make a motion that we it's at the same rates that we have had in the past. I was just looking. Yeah, the. <coughs> Provide boarding, shelter, food. It's like seventy dollars a day. Like Fifty dollars a day. Fifty. For a boarding fee. Food for vaccinations is sixty. So. Okay. That sounds about right. I would make a motion that we uh, renew our contract with the Dutchess County SPCA to provide boarding facilities when needed. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And RBT, who've been our accountants for uh, many years, I believe their rates are staying the same. The rates are more than they were um, when we initially hired them because we added the water district to have a cash audit to make sure it balanced. Mm -hmm. So what are their rates? They're higher than last year, in other words. No, they they went up last year, right? They went up last year. So the same this year, after the increase last year. Um, they do the year-end and AUD reporting. That's due March 1st for $7,000. And then general consulting services, time spent. Um, and then they do the cash audit for all the departments, which is $10,000 for, and that's for doing justice court, tax collector, town clerk, um, CFO, and water department. I think that is outrageous. Um, we've never had, for years, we used to divide the town board up into teams and we would go through the audit uh, form that was provided by the office, uh, OS, um, the comptroller's office. We uh, looked at the books, we got test samples, we looked at the last, first and last checks, where, where they keep their checks, we make find out how they balance it. it. This does not have to be done every year, is my guess. It, 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 we, you know. That's a very superficial audit. It, it is, um, I don't believe we need to spend $10,000 every year to have them go and do our job for us. We used to do that on our own. You never did it as, that was a very superficial, you asked, answered five questions on a piece of paper. We had, you didn't, you had no idea how much was them going on in those accounts. I think that if we, does every other town do this every single year? A yes, full on yes. audit. And it's the, a, it's and a, it's a cash audit of all the cash accounts. So the comptroller's office provides this um, form for board members to go through, and they why would they provide it if it wasn't in fact what was needed to to do it at least every other year? Or I, I don't mind once in a while, but ten thousand dollars to do this spot check audit. I agree, it's more thorough. We got information back. We should make sure that those um, procedures are now in place, or the re corrections that they recommended, but I don't believe that we should do the $10,000. And we'd have to sign this contract tonight? So you're saying that you know all the... I don't know everything. I'm saying that the Comptroller's Office 
provides a form. Town board members have been authorized to do it in the past. We have done it in the past. And then we have broken away from that. And I, what I understood is that we would do this, uh, you know, t once in a while to go no, back and it, make sure everything is being done the way no, it is. It needs to be done every year. Yeah. And it's a cash audit. Yeah. And it goes through everything we have to make sure we're in compliance with all yeah. of the regulations with the controller's office. And it also makes sure that all of our procedures meet what is what mm -hmm. with the controller's office. That little form with five or six questions on it is very superficial. You look at the um, the last check that was um, cut, you look at what that check is, you're not going into mm -hmm. the cash accounts and looking at them. We're spending time with them, we're going over the procedures, it is not five questions, it was two or three pages, I spent an hour with them, we got to know how they are maintaining all of their records. A lot of it's automated already. They have to put it all into BAS and log in their fees. It all has to balance. They have monthly reports that go to the state and the state looks it over. They're not issuing licenses and things. That what without, reports go to the state every month? There are financial reports that are automatically, as I understand it, uploaded to the Justice, de the Justice Department. It was always what I did, so I can't speak to all of them. But they have everything is, has to balance out. There's no way that you're going to go too far awry in 90% of it because a lot of it's already automated. I think Vicki's basic point is that <clears throat> the state comptroller gives us the ability to perform the audit ourselves. Um, and that's Superficially. Well, according to, is that what they call it? They, they refer to it as a superficial I audit? I do. Okay. Well, the state comptroller, it seems as though it would be uh, satisfactory to, the, to them if they're allowing us uh, and giving us the, allowing us to perform it and then giving us the I'm the not forms. a CPA, CPA or a CPA, and uh, I have no intention of doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell you straight I'm up, straight out. I'm happy to take your responsibility and do it myself. But yeah, we also but use them we'll to do the AUD report. responsibilities too when you start doing this ourselves. We've that, had what, legal responsibilities. That is, we are fiscally responsible for this organization, and I think our fiscal responsibility is to make sure that we're doing the best we can. Now, if the, if the comptroller's office provides us with a form and suggests that we, in fact, have the capability to do it, and we don't feel like waiving it to someone else, then, you know, that's, that's our prerogative. But if the comptroller's office is comfortable for, what, with what, it, then I don't see... What about when auditors come? Auditors will come then. Auditors come. And, and you're going to be able to sit down with the auditor and you're going to be able to answer every single question? We answer the questions that the comptroller's office, I'm not qualified to provide a full-on audit. That we would have to pay for, right? $10,000. But they haven't asked for that. But if they did, you know, those sheets get filed in a timely way. The comptroller's office looks it over and they decide whether or not it needs to be audited. It's up to you guys. If you feel fine paying ten thousand dollars for a job that we used to do ourselves, you know we can we can we can pay all kinds of people to do our jobs. That's fine. It's the point is that there were some issues with that were discovered in this cash audit. Yes. When I started doing it. But they've been reconciled. Surely, year after year, that you've been hiring them for ten thousand dollars, they've been making sure that those issues have been resolved. And they make recommendations um, if there are any changes in the comptroller's law, they make recommendations yeah. of what we need to do to be in compliance. I don't think that, to, I mean, what's the total amount of money? You're spending $10,000 on how much does the, the justice even run through? I mean, I could see the town clerk's office, but I don't see, each and every department having a ten, you know, a, a huge audit done, bound and put. It's not a forensic audit. It's a cash audit. They look at all the cash accounts and so see. Town clerk's office, I would agree, 
it's worth it to have them do that, but I don't think the, the, I can do the justice's office. I, I, really, it's not. It's up to you guys. I'll vote no. That's, you can go ahead and call that vote. I, 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 do we make the motion to call yeah, on? Go the ahead and make a motion. Exactly. I'll make, please, yeah. make, I'll make a motion that we vote on uh, paying a professional company to be doing this for us to protect the town of Amenia. Right. So you're authorizing $10,000 for the audit of the individual departments and $7,000 for the AUD, correct? Yes. $17,000. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. I made that motion. I don't know if anybody seconded it. Second. We have to do this tonight? Yes. We do. All in favor? No, we haven't had a second. In, in, no. Oh. Oh, yeah. second. I second it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Call the individual roll. Uh, okay. <laughs> Michelle. Uh, yes. Yes. Jim. No. Jamie. No. Yes. No. Motion passed. Okay. Are there any other matters? I'd like to uh, announce that the um, uh, Elf, the mil musical junior, is going to be produced uh, by the Amenia Youth Theater, uh, sponsored by the town of Amenia, on Saturday at 6.30 and Saturday at 4. No, sorry, Sunday. Saturday at 6.30 and Sunday at 4 at the Amenia Town Hall Auditorium. And I have a list of people to thank. Um, we've been rounding up everything we can because it's a giant production. And um, we have a special thanks to the Wasaic Project for sound support, the Kent School for sound support, Ballantine's Communications for lighting and equipment, Laura Smith for costuming, <coughs> Lucian Rex Roy, sound technician, Gregory Sukow for lighting technician, Todd Titone, lighting technician, Albert Tompkins for stage support, Elm Drive Elementary for set elements, Tabitha McMahon, McMahon for acting assistance. I would also add the two um, organizations that have provided grants to this make this program possible. Arts Mid-Hudson has provided uh, project support and uh, Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation Northeast Duchess Fund has provided um, significant uh, funding over uh, many years. So um, thanks to all of those people. I hope you can come out. It should be a lovely um, production for all ages. It's a lovely story. It's um, a Broadway musical based on a book that is, has got great holiday music. Thank you. It's also free. And it's free. Thank you. I would just like to make a, a comment about why I voted yes. Um, I think it's important that you have oversight, um, and uh, an audit does that. The reason why I didn't want to do it tonight was because I thought maybe we could get somebody to do it for less. Uh, we've, we've sent it out to bid, and the bids came in more than them. More than them? Mm -hmm. All right. When was the last time we bid it out? Two years ago. That was for all of our, uh, all of our. It was TV. for the same things. We broke it out spe separately yes. for the mm -hmm. audit versus the. Mm -hmm. okay. well, I wish I had more time to, you know, work on it. But mm -hmm. if we had to do it tonight, then I, I had to go for it. Okay. Um, let's 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 cheer it up, folks. We'll cheer it up. Okay. What you've you've been with us this long, so for the last. Uh, Three minutes, because I'm going to hold it. We're going to have the Parade of Lights, the Amelia Fire Company 7th Annual Parade of Lights is going to take place Friday, December 7th at 6 p.m. 5 p.m. lineup at the Amelia Firehouse, 36 Mechanic Street. Decorate a car, a truck, a tractor, or a wagon, anything mm -hmm. on wheels, and parade through the town. So uh, join, join us there. Uh, Victoria and I are going to be on a float. So I mean, that's reason enough for you for folks to come on out and have a good time. Thank you. And, bundle up. And we're going to have also busy, busy weekend. Saturday, December 8th, uh, this 
annual South Armenian Presbyterian Silver Tea from 10 to 1 p.m. at the uh, South Armenian Presbyterian Church, which everybody knows is a very historic church in this town. Soup and sandwiches available with coffee and tea. They'll be looking forward to seeing you. And last but not least, Sunday the 9th, Immaculate Conception Church is hosting its annual Living Nativity. It's around 12 o'clock right after the Sunday Mass. And they have uh, cows and, and sheep and a, and a camel and people and all kinds of camel. exciting things. Yeah, they have a camel. So come on down and see that. And a craft show. And a craft show. One of the best in town. I love this craft show. So uh, everyone, I just want to cheer you all up with that. This has been a long night for all of you and all of us. And uh, see you next week, from? in my case. And the, was and the Wasaic... Uh, Parade of Lights. Oh, that's right. The Wasaic yeah. Parade of oh, was it on my list? Wasaic Parade of Lights this Friday. That's tomorrow. No, no, Saturday. Saturday. Saturday, Saturday the, is their parade at five o'clock. Yes. And then we'll have a citizen, citizen of the Year and tree, and I guess a tree lighting. And the tree lighting. Yes. Yeah. See, there's so many things. Uh, if you don't have a calendar, you're never going to miss half of it. <laughs> so uh, that's everything I have. Does anybody else have anything? Is there any other public comment? Oh, okay. <laughs> come on, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon Kroger. <clears throat> I didn't come with a comment, but I gained one while I watched you perform. I think that discussion you just had was a very important discussion, and it is reassuring to me to have that kind of engagement and argument, and I am impressed with it, and I'm separate and apart from outcome. I would like to see you request your town clerk to reflect that in the minutes so that it isn't just an outcome, but what really took place. Thank you, Sharon. The only other uh, thing I would like to mention while you're doing your Christmas shopping to please shop local. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of lovely little shops and restaurants and people I'm sure would enjoy a gift certificate or a gift from any one of them. Are there any other town board comments? Time for the motion? Yes. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.